Now Hear This is a music review podcast and is not directly affiliated with any artists or album projects discussed on the show. Think of us like your record collection come to life. Well, except for some of those Bananarama records. What were you thinking? You got a record of your favorite songs. You got an hour and it won't take long. You got a pair of brand new friends. You got a ticket gonna stick to the end. I said, now hear this. Now hear this. Now hear this show. And the reason why I make records is because I'm just, I can just be as, as objective as I am as a person. That's a, at my most objective when I make those records. I want them to always be at least worth something. That's the way I deal with them. It upsets me whenever I see somebody in, in an acute state of ignorance about anything. <laughs> Everybody, welcome to the first ever episode of Now Hear This. Now Hear This. This is the kickoff. This is the one we, we I mean, we barely just got this working. Yeah. And it is exciting. 45 minutes later and a, and a conversation about Vore brought us <laughs> to this place. And here we are. <laughs> I'm so glad that we did not record that yeah. part. Well, well, I, I, was, I enjoyed that. I was secretly recording the whole time. Well, I will. That's part un- of my. That's part of my truth. We def- This will be ex- uh, an explicit podcast. <laughs> on if you're, um, this is a what do you call it? A red band. Yeah, red trailer. Band. Yep, red band. To sure. use in look, we're gonna use a lot of industry yeah. lingo. Hard outs, red bands, Ray bands. I that's industry. Definitely have seen an industry man or two in a Ray band. Yeah. Do people believe in synergy anymore? Is that or is that one of those like '80s and '90s terms that everybody's like, "Oh yeah, that that's just a bunch of shit." Yeah, the movement has changed, I think, away from synergy, and now it's just harsh compartmentalization. It's a cover band I'm in. <laughs> um, harsh. <laughs> it's mostly Rush songs. Yes, listen, Chicky Baby. Everything is it's 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 about conservatism mm-hmm. and that's, feeling passionately these days. It's the, so strange. It's on my business card. What you just said. <laughs> Very, very bizarre. I was, I was wondering why your title was Chicky Baby. But yes. I, just, I, I thought it was a religious thing. Or, wonder no more. Wow. Wonder no more. Well, you know, so this word <laughs> salad, um, <laughs> funny enough, is more coherent than the record we're going to speak about today. Oh, yes. Todd Rundgren's A Wizard, A True Star. Yeah. <sighs> I don't even know if I know where to begin on this. I will start by saying, on this show, Ryan and I will be exchanging albums. We'll be passing records back and forth. Ones that we're very familiar with, but but perhaps the other is not super familiar with. Correct. And talking through those records, dissecting them, maybe why we were adverse to listening to them at the start, or maybe why we hadn't listened to them before. But this is a great musical exchange. The great musical exchange. Yeah. And you're here with us at episode one. And it's going to get freaky. It, and <laughs> it already, first of all, it already is. And I made the amazing mistake of selecting this as my <laughs> <laughs> first choice. Well, I'm so happy you did because just to preface this here, Todd Rundgren is an artist for me that I have been looking for an entry point to for a while. Mm -hmm. He was actually in the first concert I ever saw in my entire life. When I was eight years old, I saw Ringo Starr and his all-star band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At uh, Pete, well, it was, it was the Garden State Art Center at the time in New Jersey. 
Oh. Shout out New Jersey, yeah. Garden State. We don't have to. We <laughs> try state area. <laughs> we could. Yeah. So I saw him in that band, and that's such like a hit space band that I just didn't really register. You don't always yeah. register what's going on there. Ringo's tours gave me a couple interesting things I explored later, like Edgar Winter. I never Amazing. knew about and got into. And oh, stuff. You saw the Edgar Winter era yeah. all star band. I did. Wow. A Procol Harm. I got to see Jack Bruce on those. Peter Frampton, Bachman, Randy Bachman. So oh, I love the Bachman. Yeah. Love the Bachman. Gotta love the Bachman. Gotta have him. But I didn't have an entry point into Todd. And Ryan, as you know, I'm a big Jack White fan. And my dad told me, he's like, you know, I never really got Jack until Mm. I sort of realized he's doing what Todd was doing kind of back in the sort of latter day prog. I understand that. Sure. I've never made that connection. (laughs) But that's, it's, that analogy is great. So anyway, I've been looking for a place, and I started in, as it turns out, a terrible place. I started with an album called Ra by his band Utopia. Oh, God. And I was like, A, what is this? B, get me out of here quickly. Yes. I felt like Brendan Frazier in the Mummy films. Get (laughs) get me as far away from this as possible, because I may have to save the world. (laughs) Well, yeah, so I don't know how that happened, but that is the worst entry point to Todd Rundgren I've ever heard. And yeah. he's already one of those enigmatic cats like Frank Zappa, where if you hear the wrong song, you're like, no, I'm not going to yeah. listen to this. And that is, that's just a prog rock album of nonsense. <laughs> no offense to anybody who loves that album. Because I'm a big Todd Rundgren head. Yeah. You should have been given the Hermit of Mink Hollow or Something Anything or Faithful or Healing. None of that. You got robbed. <laughs> <laughs> You hit a big brick wall of rock. Man. Yeah, I hit a beeline out into the desert and never came back. So this is my first foray back into the world of Todd. Well, I'm sorry also for that because this one is a wild co- it's a It's a roller coaster. <laughs> it is, it is. We were texting last night. It took me three listens to be like, oh, I like this. Yes, okay. But it was a firm three. So I guess the first time I heard this, I was in college. It would have been my freshman year of college. That is, wow, I can't believe how long ago that was now. It's in 2004. Yeah. And I remember hearing this thing on headphones. Yeah. Because I had been a big Todd fan. Because if you go on all music, every time you look up the Beatles or Paul or any of those adjacent bands, Todd Rundgren is always mentioned. And the first thing you hit is, hello, it's me. Or... I saw the light or any of it. It wouldn't have made any difference. These Beatlesque early to mid 70s ballads. And you're like, right. yes, this is great stuff. So I remember at the end of high school getting something, anything and listening to it and be like, oh, this is amazing. He's playing all the instruments on something, anything. It was really? some, somewhere in California. Yeah. It's a double disc. So the sides A through C, it's just Todd on some kind of version of 70s Ritalin. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And just making records by himself in this sort of Carol King, yeah. Laura Nairo songwriting style. And it was a huge success for him. Well, Todd, I guess, at some point in time, in it was in Los Angeles. He was like driving his car around and there were these earthquakes. Yeah. And he had this big freak out. He's like, oh, the, f- the ground can just fall out from underneath me. <laughs> Oh my God. So, yeah, so he, 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 you know, you said you bean lined it to the desert. He bee lined it back to New York. Yeah. And he built this studio called Secret Sound with, you know, you, you mentioned Utopia. I believe his name is Moogie Klingman. That was his name. He was a guy in New York. He was born of a family of synthesizers. He, I think he just came out of a synthesizer. <laughs> yeah, he's just born of that. Right. A wizard. A, a true star. Yeah. And so... Mm-hmm. Todd makes a studio with this guy in New York and he's just bringing session cats in and he started to experiment with drugs. And so I got it. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, you have this big, amazing success with this album. And then Todd even says, he's like, I don't want to be doing the same thing right. over and over and over again. And the thing that blew my mind about this is like, so Todd is approaching the studio as an instrument. It's not, oh, yeah. piano, song, guitar, song. It's what weird sounds can I put together? Yeah. I mean, that's Beatlesque in a way, too. Just using everything in the room in some capacity, yep. I guess. But so the room itself mm-hmm. became his instrument. 
Exactly. That's interesting. Just to touch on a point you made a moment ago, him no, being known for his ballads, I had no idea he was known as a balladeer. In fact, listening to this album, whenever a ballad came on, I was usually kind of checked out. But I knew him <laughs> for like... Recovering. I knew him for like bang on the drum all day. That's him, right? That, that, that's the other wacky thing about Todd. People know bang on the drum all day, which yeah. is just some song he tossed off for an, uh, an album to get out of some contract. <laughs> God. It's like modern Harry Belafonte or wow. something. Like Whoa. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it works, you know? I would love to hear a version of that song. Yeah. Stylized as Harry Belafonte. Because mm-hmm. Todd's version is very much, it's like it's <laughs> synthesizer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Harry's, <laughs> Harry's still around. Is he really? I'm 70-30, he is. Okay, well, I'll take those. I, I, <laughs> on this show, we're loose. You may know us from my other shows. We're way loose on this show. Yeah, this one's going to be pretty and loose. And as far as I'm concerned, he's alive now. And I'm going to write him a fan letter to see how he's doing. He is alive in all of our hearts, like Santa Claus or Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh, boy. Yeah. Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm. Oh, wait, let's not... Let's, um, yeah, so speaking of speed, uh, Todd Rundgren in, the, in New York in the... What is this, early 80s we talking Late 70s? Oh, yeah, let me, well, okay, so I said we were going to be loose, but I will lay some facts down because I know people like to hear about the facts. People this, love facts. This, <laughs> people love them. <laughs> it's so true. This album was released March 2nd in 1973. Whoa. So it's early 70s synthesizer music, which is part of why I'm so impressed by it. Wow. Because you're thinking 80s, right? Uh, yeah. This is... They're playing all of this by hand. This is amazing. That gives me a whole new respect for this album. Honest to God. Like, I thought this was 79, 80, 81, maybe something in there. Three. Have you listened to something, anything, the album before this? No. Okay, so that's an album, if you were to put it on, it just plays like a Beatles album or like yeah. a McCartney or a Lennon solo album. However, there are these bizarre little things. I don't know if they're sketches or... They're almost like audio jokes where they sound yeah. like like a Monty Python sketch with a synthesizer or something. And he's like, he'll be like, this is the sound of bad editing. And it'll, like the, <laughs> the voice will be all chopped up. The tape will have been edited poorly. <laughs> You know, you know, That's this good. is what a pop sound, you know, yeah, he's like right. popping into the microphone. Wow. And so that leads into this song called Breathless, which is, he has some early synthesizer and he's just doing acrobatic style arpeggios but by hand and so there's but that's it there's just like one little drop of this album on the previous album so if you listen to these records in order you can clearly see yeah oh yeah of course he's gonna do a bunch of drugs in new york and make some insane synthesizer thing but it was so early there's a progression there i mean it explains when we'll get to the tracks in a second but it explains some of like the harryisms i heard on this yes because there's a little nilson in oh, there for sure definitely. and that is much more indicative of late 60s early 70s as opposed mm-hmm. to the the later 70s when when harry was sort of for all intents and purposes, out the game. But fascinating. Did not know that. Amazing. So he's in New York City, and he built the studio, you said. Yeah, Secret Sound. So he was, he was like doing peyote buttons in between, <laughs> like put, like putting together the council, you know, like the, the recording booths and hammering pieces of wood together to create whatever baffling or all this. They're putting the studio together while they're just like, okay, let's throw a synthesizer in here and yeah. just make a record. And the thing that I found during my research that I, I just, I couldn't even believe is that he wasn't really singing at all at the beginning of these sessions. He'd bring in session players. Yeah. They'd be making track after track of stuff. So imagine being like the record label, the, right, right. the boss. He just comes off of making these Carol King style hits and then to see Todd Rundgren in the studio. <laughs> All right, boys. Two, three, four. Do you know if he wrote the lyrics in advance or if, or was it more like, because in comics sometimes yeah. what we do, you see, is we plot something out. The artist then draws it and then the, the writer comes in and puts dialogue on top of uh-huh. that. So is it was it like that? Was he laying a groundwork hearing what it turned out to be and then writing on top of it, do you know? Or was it all just sort of in his head? From what I understand, a lot of it was in his head. Okay. And he was chasing these ideas. Like they would make something and he would like 
where it was going and he would follow that right and the lyrics would come i don't <laughs> think he showed up to the studio with many songs i think there are a couple like just one victory near the end yeah but even that i believe was made in between something anything and a wizard or true star if if not just made for something anything and it didn't make it wow yes yeah, so there are clearly songs on here that are songs they're like okay here's the song like, what is the track? It's um, Sometimes I Don't Know How to Feel. Yeah, yeah. Very clearly, like in that Todd ballad style, but then something like the Lobster song, the... Oh, yeah, Just Another Onion Head. Da, da, dollar. Yeah. Da, da, dollar, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, that's why this album is amazing. To me, it's why I'm just like, wow. Yeah. I can't even believe what's happening here. Well, I, you know, it's entrancing. It's an entrancing record. You know, I have just a couple, like my overall impressions of it were like just a run. I have four bullet points. I tried to boil this down to what my overall impression you was. You boiled a Wizard of True Star down to four bullet points. Four points. I got to hear them now. It sounds like sticks if Dennis DeYoung was a teenager and lived in a hallucinogenic mushroom hatchery. <laughs> What could the other three possibly be? How many genres does one man need? Okay, I like that. It's an album that tries to do so much, and yet I feel like it could have done more. Oh my goodness <laughs> gracious. And it's not a contest, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Bullet point number four. <laughs> oh boy. Todd, if you are listening to this. <laughs> I say that out of love, because yeah. I did actually wind up it's really liking love. this. Because and well, to preface, I'm dying to go out and pick this up on vinyl and just kind of spin it a little more informally around the house to kind of like yeah. process it a little bit more. Because oh, it, yes. sometimes with albums, I almost feel like there's a barrier erected at the gate, and, yeah. and it forces you to climb that barrier in order to get inside. Mm -hmm. All that is to say, it's kind of inaccessible. This one I find, eh, I think, fairly inaccessible. Yeah, but if you if you push. And if you take that yes. journey, and if you say, yes, I will take that journey with you, Todd, it winds up being kind of fun. And I did wind up really enjoying it at the end. So all of that just preface is to say, and, but by the way, Styx is a little bit later. I mean, so, so he's, yeah, he's right. a forerunner of this stuff. I feel like he's laying a bedrock for some of this prog sound. Well, yeah, that's the thing about Todd is that he, well, outside of being the ultimate contrarian of all time, you know, if I had a number one hit or if i had a hit climbing the pop charts i would probably stop production and be like all right it's music video time it's yeah. promo mode time but that's not what todd's ever been and i look i don't want to put medical diagnoses on people diagnoses yeah. diagnoses diagnoses that's that fine. Right. It's close enough. Yeah, that's a Hollywood term, diagnosis. That's just a Hollywood jargon word we thrown at you. You're going to be learning a lot about Hollywood. Oh, so much about Hollywood. Yeah. We're uh, literally overlooking the Hollywood sign right now. Is, that is true. is true. We can see the Hollywood sign from here, mm -hmm. and yeah. there's probably an unpaid intern somewhere <laughs> here cleaning something that they wish they, they weren't <laughs> practicing their lines <laughs> for their future success. <laughs> So he, he has said, he's like, well, I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure I have ADD. Okay. And uh, I'm pretty sure this confirms it. Yes. You know. And you know what? We got something very interesting out of it. I think just for my own personal taste, I would have loved a little more structure. But I get that it's sort of a smattering of structure. And I, you know, I'm fine with that. And especially learning what I just learned about, okay, this was actually 1973. It's early, yeah. Gives me a whole different point of view on it because he's doing stuff that I don't think a lot of people were doing at that time. Right. Yeah. This is band on the run era. Yeah. Mind stuff. Yeah. And I mean, what was Paul doing with the Moog outside of the soul? <laughs> right. Are you a fan of Roger Joseph Manning Jr.? Do you know this Not cat? Familiar, no. He is. He was in the Moog Cookbook, and mm -hmm. I believe he tours with Beck. He's okay. just like one of the cats in LA. Like, and just last year, he has a quote where he said he loves this record. He's like, "Stuff is distorting. Parts are panned all crazy. There's so much nuttiness going on. Yeah, but it ends up enhancing the songs because it adds that much more charm and character. Yes. Oh, I absolutely. And I have some closing thoughts, which we'll get to, but it includes some of those key words. I would like to. Is it Moog or Moog? I've always been told it rhymes with Vogue or okay. Rogue. All right. So I have been mispronouncing it 
my entire life as Moog. You know, so many do. And yeah. So is it really a mispronunciation if everybody says it as one thing? Potato, potato. Capo, capo. Oh, I say both. Do you? Upon. Can I get the capo? I guess it's capo. I thought it was capo. Capo. Yeah, I say capo. I've heard capo. I've heard capo. What's another one? But capo sounds like a, a puppet, like the name of a puppet. Like I would name a puppet capo. Like a character's name or like a style of puppet. No, just a puppet. One singular it's, puppet it's, in the Jim Hansen world. Oh, hey, capo. It does sound like a puppet. He is a Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> style. <laughs> so, yes. So, shall we dive into the record? I think we should. International feel. I didn't know what to make of it at first. And now it's one of my favorites. So I have a couple favorites to call out here. International Feel and its reprise later on are really strong for me. I love the freak out tones. The groove is so good. When this guy finds a pocket and Mm -hmm. lives there for a minute, it's actually, he's great. Like it's, it's more like what I am looking for in a Todd Rundgren Mm -hmm. album, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it's just what I'm looking for in a rock album, but like, I wish he would live in that pocket longer. No, you like the groove. Yeah, but it's a highlight. It's a highlight for me. Yeah. So in what had it been, 2009 or 2010, I was living in New York and Todd announced that he was going to be touring yeah. his albums. Right. Finally, everybody had been asking for so long. Because you go see a Todd Rundgren show, he will play the exact thing you do not want to hear. <laughs> That's been Todd. As long as I've known him. So like, fine, I'm going to play these records. So I flew to Chicago and I got a couple of tickets and called up some old friends playing the Vic Theater. And I had no idea what I was going to expect yeah. or see or any of that. So I knew it was Todd. It was Prairie Prince on the drums who had played with the tubes, I believe. Prairie Prince. Chasm Sultan, who was in Utopia. Mm-hmm. A couple of cats from the band The Cars. Yeah. Because yeah. Todd had like taken over The Cars from Rick. For a minute. Was that the new car? The new car. I remember that. Yeah. They had that song. Not tonight. Not tonight. Which is like, yeah, we're going to get together, but you know what? Not tonight. It, <laughs> <laughs> I love, oh my God, you're, you're blowing my mind. I haven't thought about that song in 15 years. Oh, it's, you, you need to re-listen to it because it is excellent. It's great. I'm going to take you to another fight, but, but not, not tonight. tonight. I was listening to that driving around the Route 1. Just route to give some one, yeah. n- some New Jersey in there, uh, driving around Route One in my uh, 1995 Saturn, mm. uh, blaring "Not Tonight" by the New Cars. What color was that Saturn? So blue it was black, just like <laughs> how I feel <laughs> after listening to this Todd Rundgren album one too many times. <laughs> so blue that I've turned black. Yeah. So yeah, so. The point to this long rambling story about Mm -hmm. international feel is that all those synthesizer sounds start and it's like a light show in the Vic. Yeah. And then Todd Rundgren comes out in a full astronaut costume with like a Madonna microphone. Holy shit. (laughs) And I just screamed. So good. So yeah, every time I put this on, I just get that psyched up again where I'm like, oh yep, we're going to space. Let's go. Let's go to space. That you can, and we we do, and we will. Wow. So you mentioned the beat too. So yeah. the thing that I remember just being blown away by is like there's a traditional rock beat, you know, it's yeah. eighth notes on the hi-hat right. and the snare is hitting two and four. And then it's like, it flips in verse two yeah. where it's eighth notes on the snare and he's playing the hat dum, dum, cha, dum, dum, as, yeah. the, as the backbeat. And you're like, where are we going? Right. All of a sudden, I'm like, everything is flipped upside down. Yeah. We don't know what's happening. These amazing background vocals. Yeah. Who is that? Is that just him doing it over and it's over? And over? Mo- it's all Todd. It's it's, all there's, Todd. there's a lot of session musicians and... We could blitz names and things, but yeah. this is a Todd Rundgren record. It's yeah. him just organizing, and he does a lot of those female voices. You're like, that sounds like a chick, but it's Todd. He has a falsetto capability. And he, he busts it out on occasion here. I think, yeah, I think I just needed a little more chugging guitar on it, which I wrote right. 
a few times going down this track listing here. I think mm-hmm. I just needed some more chugging guitar to yeah. kind of bring me. Right. It's like watching a person with no skeleton or something. Like all the stuff is there, but like it's got nothing holding it together and could fall apart at I mean, any that moment. That would be horrifying to see a man <laughs> with no skeleton just walking around. But that said, what I appreciate about this and the next, like, I don't know. 10 or 11 tracks is that Mm -hmm. they don't linger that long. So even if you're not feeling that particular movement of his fucked up symphony or whatever, Mm -hmm. you're out in a minute 30. Right, right, right. right. And this one, I think what, it's like three minutes, two minutes, 50, something like that. This one's one of the longer ones just on this first side. But a lot of it is that there's like a 45 second or whatever it is. It's pretty long, the buildup of all the tones. And then... Right, right. Boom, boom, boom. Which brings us to a transit, like so. So all the tracks kind of bleed into one another a little bit. I guess you could kind of call this a concept album ish. I don't know. It's it's more like I guess what the Beach Boys were doing in, at, like in the late sixty. Yeah, yeah, the smile stuff where it's just all one long kind of song. It's got that right. feel to it, yeah, more of absolutely. like a medley. Which it brings us to the second track here, which is Never Never Land, which is not a Todd song. So it's from the Peter Pan musical, and I I, I don't remember if it's cut from the musical or it was but it's a pretty dark song that never neverland tune yeah. and it's yeah you you go from space to i know a dream yeah i don't know if i buy him as sincere the record is so sarcastic almost it's got oh, this 100% jokey and stuff so i don't know if sincere always fits him super well but in this one it got close yeah it does well i didn't write it right <laughs> Okay, well, maybe that's it. That must be it. But yeah, I do love how... I mean, I don't have a lot to say about that tune. I don't either, no. I, I like it enough, but I do love how in that, at the end, never, never... And then you're back in the Todd Rundgren album to the top of the next song. Which is another highlight for me on the record. I'm glad you're saying that, because yeah. I that's the one I go back to, and it's just an instrumental. Well, except for one word repeated. But it's so good. So we're talking about tick, tick, tick it wears off yeah and i think this is just oof if the whole record was like this it grooves yeah. an international feel and is it my name i feel like this would have been like an ep i would have just flipped over out over, over. Yeah, yeah well there are things we could cut well maybe we come back to yeah. like, what would you have cut off what would have been on the yeah just the wizard right EP. <laughs> just the wizard <laughs> you know? forget the true star he's dead yeah. to me uh, but I, I love the intro. It's ultimately a lot like the album itself. I'm not sure it really goes anywhere, but I like the ride. Mm. I love where it starts and it, it kind of trips off a little bit, but I do like it. And it's badass. You yes. know, it's got that badass kind of quality that I'm constantly, I'm hoping he'll get into more on the record and then he just doesn't. I feel like he's just messing with us yeah. on occasion. You know, he's yes. like, he he starts to push that way and then... Hard left or hard tick, right. Tick, 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 it wears off. So it's what, a minute, one minute, 15. Yeah, it's so good. So we're, we, we've entered into this like minute, minute, and the, the channel changes before it really resolves. You get to the point and you're just like, wait, what? I, you feel like you're just getting sucker punched a bit. Yeah. But in like an enjoyable way. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Am I a masochist? No, well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, you might be. I may or may not be, but I do enjoy the ride. And mm-hmm. yeah, I agree with you. This one. Just the way, like the, the drum tone, and there's all these little like boop, 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 mm-hmm. synthesizers, yeah, and it yeah. sets the stage for a lot of the background vocals that come later. Sure. Like the Give It To Me Now's in, what is that song? Give It To Me Now, Give It To Me Now. now. I think it's just another Onion Head. Mm-hmm. He really somehow sets the stage for more insane things later with yeah. my keyboard. So. It really reads more like a, a symphony kind of thing, just a really deranged, Correct. beautiful symphony. This one is an example where I'm like, okay, I get it. I get this. Yeah. International feel, this one, I get it. I understand you know? it. So then how do you feel about Need Your Head? It's so schizophrenic. I just can't yeah. get into it. Like it jumps I don't ar- love it. It just jumps around so much. I love the guitar solo. And ultimately, it doesn't overstay its welcome, which is good. It it lasts. It lasts just long enough for me not to be annoyed enough to turn it off. Right. 
you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I see where. And by the time it's over, it would have been where a chorus would have hit in like a modern pop yes. song. You're like, okay, cool. That right. that was in, that was insane. Yeah, <laughs> it was an insane thing. Well, you need to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little early meatloaf uh-huh. okay yeah you i know? can see that yeah his lyrics I, I picked out a couple throughout the course of the album are, they're pretty good and they're funny if he had really deeply serious lyrics i would not take this album seriously at no all. absolutely not but because he's doing it with a wink and a nod yeah and the tongue-in-cheek it works for me in places and i'm willing to forgive some of the maybe what i would have perceived as cornier bits mm-hmm. you know uh, Butch, well, I don't know. Do you have anything more on you need your head? Because I'm dying to get to track five here. Please. This uh, is where it opens up. Rock and roll pussy. Oh, yes. Um, wow. Yes. Another sloppy one, no pun intended, like You Need Your Head. And I thought they were screaming holy disco. I didn't know Mm. what they were screaming. But only just for is what they're screaming. And he basically just, he crafts this whole song around a feeling, I guess, I've never experienced it in in the context that he's experiencing it, but I think he's talking about. So rock and roll pussy is obviously this pervasive thing, this groupy thing that goes on in rock rock bands, and he creates this frantic energy only just for only just for, see, only just for really fast. And the phrasing on that is actually really nice. I love the way he he uses the phrasing there, and he uses it to build this manic thing, and then he breaks it down right at the end only just for rock and roll pussy. <laughs> Yes. And it's it works so well and then we're out of it and I'm like perfect. Are you ready to have your mind blown? Blow my mind please. This song is about John Lennon. Good God. Good God. And I'll get, so I do have some research on this. I'll get into. Please do. So the line get up and see the revolution on the TV. Yeah. John Lennon took as being a, a jab at him to his song Revolution. And so this actually led to a war of words between Lennon and Rundgren in the press. And so I pulled a few of these quotes. So in September 73, Todd did an interview with the British music magazine Melody Maker. Which, by the way, Lennon had used to trash McCartney on more than yes. one occasion. So he's pretty well versed in this. And, and, to, and for context, John's on his last weekend here. So he's in... Oh, he's drinking like a bottle a day. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe more. Who yeah. knows? It's him and Keltner doing blow in the studio. Good. <laughs> Good. So, so Todd says, John Lennon ain't no revolutionary. He's a, I mean, I'll redact the F word. He's an F an idiot, man. Shouting about revolution and acting like an ass. It just makes people feel uncomfortable. All he really wants to do is get attention for himself. And if revolution gets him at attention, he'll get attention through revolution. So, Whoa. you know, Lennon's not going to Take that lightly. Wow. So he says, John writes, as he was writing to about Paul and all that, Lennon says, <laughs> an open lettuce to sod runt whistle. <laughs> yeah. I, pulled so- I mean, you got to go look at these online and read them. Like, I used to like read them every month because they would make me cry laughing. <laughs> Because Todd is, I mean, excuse me, John is just such a genius with words. Yeah. And he can just say the thing that it will stab somebody. So Todd says, somebody played me your rock and roll pussy song, but I never noticed anything. Wow. Period. I think that the real reason you're mad at me is because I didn't know who you were at the Rainbow, L.A. Remember that time you came in with Wolfman Jack? Well, when I found out later, I was cursing because I wanted to tell you how good you were. So he like gets him by yeah. saying like, yeah, 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 you got me. Right. But I, I really love you, man. I like you. And, and I think you're the rock and roll. He's implying he's the pussy. Yeah. And I, I, I need to pull up this letter. But every time he uses Todd's name, he's, <laughs> he's saying like a different word like Todd or Sod yeah. or Rod. It's a dismissive 
gesture yeah, yeah, on yeah. his part. Todd Sad Dodd. <laughs> That's so, that's so good. Yeah. So it's, you know, it ties back in, uh, we both love the Beatles. It's how we've really come to be friends because of that. So yeah, that's, he's, he's channeling Spaniard in the works and in his yes. own right and stuff like that, yep. but he's doing it. It's really an ultimate asshole jab. Like, mm-hmm. you know, his nickname for Paul was Beetle Ed Oh my God. for a little while there. Like I it, didn't know that. Yeah. In the, in 71 when he, there's, I don't know if they actually captured the audio. I think they did. It's him and George talking and they're at, they're talking about what Beetle Ed is up to. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's, it's just an ultimate, like, I don't respect you. Oh. So I didn't even bother to say your name right or at all. Beetle Ed. <laughs> John, George, Ed, and uh, Zingham, and or Z- something. You know. <laughs> but it's funny, like, I don't think Todd was even unique in criticizing Lennon for revolution. Right. Because it is kind of milk toast in its noncommittal way. And we won't talk about revolution right now, but I'm, I think Lennon was getting it from all sides on that song mm-hmm. by his, like, counterculture, like his re- yeah. revolutionary buddies would, would be criticizing. That's why you get, like, power mm-hmm. to the people. And so, anyway. I agree with you. And yeah. also, milk toast, that's another industry term we throw around a lot so much so much i actually much. love that word i'm so excited that yeah. you used it i just bought into this show as a co-host for the whole journey because you said that there word. you go i've been listen i've been just trying to <laughs> you're the whole, real rock and roll this whole here. time <laughs> well, i'm the real rock and roll pussy i'm gonna write into melody maker are they still around i don't know uh, maybe maybe i should know that um well let's talk about dog fight giggle because sure. i have one impression of yeah. this and it's just okay uh, okay okay the word okay it's just like note? uh actually i just wrote down um okay <laughs> <laughs> did you is there an ellipsis how many periods are in the ellipsis it's a, it's a comma oh uh, yep. didn't even have time you're like uh okay i didn't even spell out okay i just put the o and the k I just, right, yeah. I don't, like, it's just, this one is a little navel gazy to me. This one is a little, it's a like. Trans, it's like a studio guy thing where it's music concrete or music concrete, however you say it. Mm-hmm. It's splicing tape together, speeding things up, slowing it down. It's really all just for the gag at the end. Right. It's it's juvenile. It's Yeah. It's like, oh, what, you? Oh, it just sounds like sex to you? Where I didn't hear sex at all the first time I heard it, I was just like, oh, this is kind of rad, weird noise. Yeah. Let's see where it leads into. Right. A- am I driving around listen with this on repeat? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Probably listen to it in full twice. Yeah. It's just, it's, um, I get why it's there. It's a transitionary thing. And Again, like everything else, it doesn't really overstay its welcome. It would be different yeah. if that was like three minutes long or something like that, but it's not. It's like a what, it's not minute raw. Something. Yeah, it's definitely not, not as raw. long as raw. Mm-mm. But it's where he starts to lose. Like, that's where it goes. Like, there's portions of this record where I'm like, he goes too far. And then there's portions yeah. of the record where I'm like, why didn't you take this to the place it needed to go? So, uh-huh. like, there's this dichotomy about this album for me uh-huh. where I think he's simultaneously shooting for too much and not enough at the same time. I mean, we are still only on track six yeah, of, well, what, 19. Yeah, is, so there let's... is a lot. <laughs> so you don't have to camp around. Mm-hmm. A little cringy for me. I feel like he's taking shots where he shouldn't be. I liked the song more when I was an idiot college kid. Mm. And now I hear it, I'm like, yeah, it's a nice song, but why? I'd strike this one off. Yeah, this one, this is one of the Harry channeling songs right, Harry, that, sure. that I felt and... Um, you know, I think my only other note on this one, at least these songs are only a minute long. Like I didn't, I'm not trying to hang out with this one. I don't think uh, no, much no, like no, you, no, no. Um, but it's, it's okay. He's painting a weird picture and we're all just watching him draw what he's going to draw. And some of it is going to not make a whole lot of sense, but I feel like this is one of those albums you really do have to kind of digest as a one work which is right. also what I find annoying about it because there's not a lot of things I can just pull out mm-hmm. and listen to for mm-hmm. its own sake. It's more of a experience you have to have happen to you. Yes, that's true. Whereas like tick, 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 if you tick, tick, tack another minute onto that one or, and you do, you know, you know what I mean? Like that yeah, turns yeah. into a song for me. I can pull out of this thing and put on a playlist or something. You but could the, double tick, 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 it wears off and then have him write a lyric or something over the back half of it. And you'd be like, oh yeah, cool. That's pretty rad. Yeah. This one, it's like, eh. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. But yeah, it's a minute. Which brings us into the psychedelic pool supply store that is Flamingo. Wow. 
Wow. It sounds, it's got a Muzak quality Whoa. to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I actually would like to re-listen to it now just because you said that. <laughs> it's like, it's got these noodling melodies and they're they're actually compelling. I really do like the melody, but tonally it's doing some things here and there that are almost like 8-bit video game music or something. Yeah, Todd will do that every once and again. Which again made more sense to me when I when I was putting this in the late 70s, early 80s. And actually, now that, now that I know it's 73, I think it's probably way more innovative <laughs> than I gave it credit for. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Because you think of computers and MIDI and how easy it is to make records now where he's, he's doing all this stuff by hand yeah. on tape. I think just like, having to stack stuff. Sure. I think like Mark Mothersbaugh was listening to this and going, I would like one of those, please. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Frank Ocean sampled this too. Really? Yeah. For, I think it's the song, is Solo a song or is that a record? I like Frank Ocean. Um, I haven't listened to him in a while. People sample Todd, and there's good reason to, because who in the hell else outside of you and me yeah, right. <laughs> and what the 15 guys listening to this episode right now are like, <laughs> Flamingo Man. Can you just say Flamingo Man again? Flamingo Flam- Man. How about again? Flamingo Man. But now, that was nice, but can you say it like you mean it? Like Flamingo Man. Okay. We'll work on it. Hollywood stuff. We'll work on it. These are called takes. (laughs) I'm being directed right now. Yeah. I mean, not directed so much as like, I think we can't use that. (laughs) (laughs) Strike it. Strike Strike it. it. You ever heard that Shatner thing where he's like getting directed by somebody? He's like, oh, no, no, no. We'll do it your way. I guess I'm just describing working with William William Shatner. Shatner. There's one I'm recalling specifically where he's arguing about the pronunciation of sabotage. Uh, Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's what it is. Where he says sabotage. Sabotage. Because that's how they say it in Canada. Sabotage. Sabotage. Connecting Shatner to Flamingo and to Todd Rundgren. That's what you're going to get from this podcast. (laughs) Amongst many things. The last note I have on Flamingo is I think he thinks he can just charm his way through this record. And sometimes Uh, he does. Yeah. That's, Sometimes. that's nice. I could take Flamingo a bit shorter, but I do really love the next track, Zen Archer. Yeah, this is another one where I wanted chugging guitar on it and less of like the messed up circus tapestry he's weaving. Yes. But there are some bursts of greatness in this writing and it's enough to keep you interested. I think. Yes. After a string of one minute songs, this one stands out because it trips off into this five minute epic. So... By point of contrast, I feel like it grinds the album to a halt a little bit, but I kind of like it when we're there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Scissor Sisters at all, but this one had had a lot of Scissor Sisters sound on it. So I think those guys may have been channeling Todd for, um, I'm thinking of specifically their album, Tada. Or Tada? Tada? How do you pronounce Tada? Tada! I think it's Tada, yeah. Tada! Mm -hmm. And I love the sax. Yes. And that sax is 1973 written all over it. Oh, big time. Yeah. You couldn't not have a sax on your song at that time. Mm -hmm. And there's all these great stereo studio effects of the archer shooting the bow and the arrow. They go pan left to right. I like that. All of that. Yeah, yeah. The panning's great on this. Yeah. The album is a lot different. On headphones than it is even on a nice stereo system. Yeah. Because Todd must have been doing some mixing in his headphones. And so you're playing to the medium then if you put the headphones on. I remember hearing this on headphones and just hearing it once and being like, all right, I'm going to go again. And it's it's like doing drugs without having to do drugs. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is, we're out of the age of mono here. So he's mixing to stereo. Mm-hmm. And so... I feel like the prog rockers are the ones experimenting with panning, like you say, and moving yes. moving things around. And so it makes a lot of sense that he's experimenting in that fashion. Who are some, like, for context here, who are we talking about in terms of his prog rock contemporaries? We're talking about, yes, were they a thing yet? That's a really good question. Let me look that up. I know ELO is a thing, or at least... Early, ELO is early, definitely yeah. either starting or around... This says yes is 68 to yeah. 81 before so, they broke up until 83. There you go. So the owners of the Lonely Hearts themselves, mm. they're out doing their thing. I guess I should have said this at the top. I really struggle with Prague. Like I always want to like Prague more than I do because of the experimentation is so rampant that I feel like mm-hmm. there's no structure to keep me engaged. 
But it's interesting to think about what he's doing versus what if some of his contemporaries are doing. I mean, I have a quote that kind of speaks to the whole progginess of it. So Todd said, this is in an interview with The Guardian back in 1973, mm -hmm. where he says, it's hard for me to say that what I'm doing isn't even really music because deep inside of me, what I want to do is much greater than music. <clears throat> Exactly. <laughs> Music is the way I understand how to communicate now, okay. the way that I've learned how to communicate. But it will eventually have to go beyond that. You see, I've realized that music is not what keeps people involved. It's the attitude behind the music. Yeah. So a lot of, I think, Prague to what you're saying, except for I've, I'll put Rush on. I'm, I'm cool with Rush. But yeah, some of these really long as you said, navel gazing, sort of like, ah, I'm so great. Look yeah. at how I can play the guitar. It's like, so what? Right. Entertain <laughs> me with a song. Write a song. Write a song. You know? Uh, yeah. Again, I don't mean to take a big old dump on the, on the prog genre. I know there's people who really love it, but I think I just naturally want more structure out of something. And so I found listening to this challenging in those ways but you know what it's yeah. good to get out of your comfort zone and to challenge yourself and if anyone's gonna shake you out of a comfort zone i'm pretty sure it might be todd run yes yeah they definitely will do that the last note i have on this song is there's uh, sound effects and shit flying around there are definitely those mm -hmm. and yeah i mean zen archer yeah great so brings us to just another onion head da da dolly this is a huge highlight for me just because of how insane it is the blessing of the turtles, the eggs lay on the lawn. Paint the pretty picture, for me this is the one. The calling of the rabbit, the calling of the hare. The hat band then begins to play, the song is everywhere. Is insane. This is another Harry-ish one for me. I love the surreal lyrics. He's talking about the blessing of the turtle at one point. Yep. Hey man, you're just another onion head. At some point, I think he says he's gonna cut a baby's butt. Yeah, have another helping prime cut of baby's butt. Okay. <laughs> quite an image. Not one you really want, but it is quite <laughs> an image. It's striking for sure. Um, it's good. I like the, I like, I like it. It's, it is delightfully weird. It's delightfully weird. A sip of holy water, a shot of saving grace. So there's a song called saving grace, something along those lines on something, anything. Todd is just on one long stream of consciousness. It feels like from like 1970 until yeah. whenever he just stops becoming interested in music. I don't know if you know this. Todd started to just program computers in the eighties. Oh God. Yeah. And I don't know if it's paint or some other thing that's close to paint, but I've read reports that Todd's like, oh, yeah, I, I made the first version of paint, but it wasn't commercialized. Wow. That could be wrong. I could be wrong about that. Wow. Yeah, he just started coding. He's like, he lost his taste for making records. Wow. And you can definitely see that. Like by 1990, you put on a Todd Rundgren album and it's like him rapping about. Oh, no. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. You get that with some artists, you know, they just lose their taste for it. Right. I love you want the obvious, you'll get the obvious. Something about that mantra on this record. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about, Todd? <laughs> <laughs> you want the obvious, you'll get the obvious. Then all of a sudden it's da, 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 good. Like I did that before, the whole. <laughs> It's bananas, but it is. it's memorable. It is. And that warms me up for the next track. Yeah. When when the shit hits the fan, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. I love the song. And finally, it's like a rock tune, you know? Yeah. So this is another one where I felt like he got a pocket. He found a pocket and lived in it for a mm -hmm. minute. It dances around a bit. It wanders away from where I like it to be. Almost, you know, he's just, yeah, the ADD thing makes perfect sense to me. Complete sense. Because it just, it sounds like listening to these songs, sometimes halfway through, it sounds like he just lost interest and moved on to something right. else. And then yeah. maybe remembered and went back to it. Yes. Um, but yeah, if this were heavy guitar, I would love it. Like just unabashedly love it. Instead, I just like it. Yeah, I understand. It's the synth he's using coupled with the flutes to get that circusy sounding. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's almost like 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh huh. It might be a synthesizer triggered through guitar. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if Todd knows anymore. I don't know if he knew at the time. Do you know if he was a Beef Art fan? Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure Todd's big. Because there's similarity. Now that I'm thinking about it, I feel like I listen to Trout Mask Replica a lot recently for reasons that I'd care not to get into. And mm-hmm. I'm sensing some overlap. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But where Todd is more sarcastic, I think... Um, Beefheart is it's like it's more artistic and there's like a yeah. genuine yeah. expression to it, even though he's still fucking with you the whole time. He is messing with you, yeah, and it borders on pretension, but never quite gets there. Right. Yes. But it, they both. I feel like Todd and Beefheart are both butting up against pretension <laughs> constantly. It's not a competition. I do love <laughs> earthquake in New York City. That image. Uh, the IRA just hit London. Mm. What is the IRA? It's, was it the... Oh, that's the Irish Revolutionaries. The Irish Republican Army, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Give Ireland back to the Irish, man. I'd love... Well, okay. You want to really... <laughs> sidestep. I love that song. I do too. And the story about how you could hear them jamming it from the street yep. in Abbey Road. And you're like, that must have been fucking loud. Yeah. Amazing. Instrumental too. I mean, this song to me is just like, it's like very anxiety it's like todd's anxieties in yeah. what i had said about leaving la because of the earthquake and now he is imagining an earthquake in new york sure but yeah it's it's good it's, it's a good one it's a it's a decent little track we are still not through the first side of I the know. album i know well we end here on on a reprise le fil international oh here we finally made it <laughs> i love it i it makes the album feel cohesive even though it's not it, it's like you could call an album a concept if you have a, a title and a reprise, basically, yeah, sure. because as long as you're wrapping it up, uh, it's, we're it's open it's, tonight. We're open tonight. <laughs> but I dig it, um, per- particularly because it's a strong track to hang the record on. Yes. And I'm happy he had that good sense. I feel like sometimes he needed maybe an editor, or like somebody to tell him, bad, that's a bad, that's a bad Todd. Ta- stop it. Ta- stop. But this, this is a good choice. I'm happy he made this choice. So in the amount of time that we've been recording, which, at, you know, I'm clocking at 50 or so minutes, however, like the, the, <laughs> that side was only 28 minutes and 21 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> well, it's a good side closer. And the, the opener of um, side two, sometimes I don't know what to feel, has more of that balladeery stuff you were talking about earlier it's got this kind of like motown vibe but i do think there's a charm to it he's again playing with the stereo pan here which i think is effective and i feel like he's a little ghost in your headphones bouncing Hmm. around yeah to different sides of your head whispering either sweet nothings or terrible terrible ideas i need to get my head checked out now that you now that you say that like (laughs) why is this one of my favorite records (laughs) I love the the line, someone said the world's going to end, and I think it's true. It's kind of fun, you know? He has a song that comes around a little later called Tiny Demon or Tiny Demons, and it's ex- literally exactly what you were just talking about Yeah, is the concept of the song. Okay. So that's obviously some kind of vein in yeah. Todd's psychology you've just tapped into. It's good. I like the track. You know, it's it's nice. But again, it's one of those genre things where I would have preferred just a guitar record at right. a certain point, and then we got this. Yeah, I'm like, what is this? That song is it's it could have been on on Herman and Mancalo or something, anything, or any of these records where he's just making pop songs. Right. And so I guess that's all. And so by the way, so the A side was the international feel. That's like the wizard side. Okay. And then side two is a true star. Oh, so it's like a speaker box in the love below. Correct. Kind of. Correct. Right. Way before. Yeah. The AT aliens did it. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. What a song, man. So Todd is saying here, I became more aware of what music and sound were like in my internal environment, speaking to the tiny demons you yeah. speak about, and how different that was from the music I had been making. A new challenge was to try to map as directly as I could the various kinds of chaotic musical elements in my head. 
So he says, I never took acid to my knowledge. <laughs> but I, really? Uh, but I, yeah, I know. But I imagine it would have been similar to some of the other experiences I had. And so, you know, so it's like we've been through the acid trip. Right. And now he's, it's like a palate cleanser of balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I do like this second side a lot. I think it's got my favorite track of the album on it. I'll say that. Okay. But the, the ballad stuff is a little, I'm a little shaky on that. I mean, I guess that's a great segue into Does Anybody Love You, which is the second track on the I side. love this song. It's got, this one's McCartney-ish to me. Yeah. It's like a Paul, t- mm-hmm. little Paul song. It's the piano. It's the production quality. It sounds like something off Back to the Egg or yeah. something. Yeah. And the melody is cute. I'm not in love with it ultimately, but I like what he's trying. Me too. Yeah. It is my favorite sarcastic line on the album, which is love between the ugly is the most beautiful love of all. <laughs> and you're like, well, you, c- you are an asshole, <laughs> but you're not wrong. <laughs> uh, the title of his memoir. <laughs> right. Well, that brings us to the medley. The here. medley. Yes. Yeah, so this is, you know, this could have been trimmed down a bit, but I enjoy it. I didn't realize this was covers except for Cool Jerk until right. I was looking at the track list last night. And so interesting, I guess. Um, it's a head scratcher for me. The whole thing is like, it's got like a Prince thing going on mm-hmm. a little. It's got almost like a, what are those like, um, like those funk records. It's like that. I feel like they're the soundtracks to like black exploitation films. Right, like, sure. There's a song, Didn't I Blow Your Mind This Time? Didn't mm-hmm. I? Yeah, you know, it's, I guess it's it's fun. It's fun, sure. Yeah. yeah. Of the bunch, I think La La Means I Love You has my interest the most. That's my favorite one, too. I wish he wrote that song. It sounds like a song he could have written. I was, yeah, hoping William was. Hart and Tom Bell. And yeah, I mean, I'm so proud and Ooh Baby Baby, they almost sound like the same song yeah, until I, you're shocked out of it by <laughs> Cool Jerk in 7-4 or was it 7-8, something like that time. Yeah. The note I've written here is, it sounds like a psycho murderer is singing this to you as he Christian bails a knife into you repeatedly. Yeah, well, that is where we've come this far on this record, isn't it? <laughs> Again, that stick sound is here too, but it's like deranged sticks. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Because that takes us to Hungry for Love. It's okay. Hungry for Love is all right. It really seems like he's just kind of cramming them in before he gets to the last couple of big tracks on the record. Yeah, I feel like a broken record, but I feel like if it was lead guitar instead of that jovial piano jubilation, I would really love this way more. What is it, like a tuba or something? (laughs) Or it could be a synthesizer. Yeah. The solo is nice. Uh, this is another one I liked, but not as much as some of the others. Good lyrics, but again, I think a lot of the songs that have made their point have made their point by this point. Yeah. If that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. Which takes us to I Don't Want to Tie You Down. I never remember that this is on this album. I think from this point on, I really like the album ending. The back half, it continues to succeed because all the heartfelt balladeering kind of feels heartfelt and particularly in this case and his vocal is sincere which on a record of dripping psychotic sarcasm is kind of like hey a plus for getting that to work somehow yeah yeah Yeah. and it definitely clears the path for these last two songs that are two of my favorites on the record yeah is it my name is my favorite on the record awesome it's one of my new favorite songs (laughs) I've just been playing this one constantly. Oh, wow, okay. I was just entranced by this one. I can't believe he buried it at the end. Where the hell is this sound on the rest of this album? Where mm. the hell is this? I have no idea. I agree completely with what you're saying. What the? It made me angry at him that he didn't do this more. Because I was like, you clearly have it in you. Like, this Definitely. is great. Yes. And the lyric, every line in this song, there is cause and effect. Yeah. There's a reason I'm so erect. <laughs> 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 you know. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the riff is great. The, the, and we were talking about f- some phrasing earlier, the why don't you love me? It's just perfect. He uses it as it's just a counterpoint to the guitar and the solo is scorching. I don't know. I wanted the rest of the album to be this. I do really wish he would have cut out the my voice is so high. I wish I was gay line because that did not age well. No, at yeah, all. That, maybe that's why I can't really do this one anymore. Maybe it's why nobody's talking about it. It's not. It's not a good look. For I play him. my guitar in such a man cock way. <laughs> why don't you love me? Uh, maybe it's your oh my rhetoric, God. Todd. Oh, oh that's my why. God. Oh my God. You only love me for my oh, machine. I can't do this. Wait, what, what machine? Ryan, all right, I quit. Well, it's been nice talking to you. <laughs> and uh, that's the show for Man, you, folks. Yeah. Mancock Way was our working title of the podcast. Yes, see. it was before the injunction and the <laughs> cease and desist. <laughs> there were handcuffs involved. This is this is a very progressive podcast. I think it's a prog cast. <laughs> and you're welcome for that universe i am certainly welcome yeah and you are all welcome to turn this off i guess <laughs> but i do i do love this song i do that's oh, great yeah i know i love us this is this is really high fidelity of me i don't mean to cusack all over you right now but i know oh. i i know i really love a song when it goes to number one on a playlist i'm making and mm. then i don't skip it mm. so this one i keep on and i caught my wife humming this the other day well this is why we do this show folks to turn you on to new stuff yeah and i was like i was so proud in that moment that my wife was humming todd rundgren to herself track 18 (laughs) (laughs) on a wizard of true star that is an accomplishment i was so happy and proud and happy for you really was the takeaway um was was this a single did he no the only single off this record was Sometimes I don't know what to feel in April of 73. What a weird choice. It's buried on the back of an insane... If you've made it this far, yeah, you either are curious or insane. <laughs> this is, so this is the reward. Yes. Yeah. At least it was for me. Like We exchanged the, the songs before we record this so we could each listen to them if we don't have mm-hmm. those albums because I, I'm the last holdout against Spotify. We found him. Yeah. We- <laughs> Send him in, boys. <laughs> so... You actually didn't send me a complete version of the album. I had to find it. It was. It was oh no! It was, what, did, what was I? What was missing? It only had like ten tracks on it. So I, I actually oh didn't boy. listen to the full thing until last night. So this one was on way earlier, but listening to it all the way through, and it's only at the very end. I'm like, what the hell? That's crazy. And then the last one here, just one victory. It's just like this little furious Elton John tune out of nowhere. Oh, it's so great. And yeah. the two melodies that play at the same time, like the positive message of the song. Yeah. It's Get good. It just one victory. I guess it was recorded either twice as fast or half as fast. There was some engineering stuff that Todd had to fix. So sure. it gave it a bizarre kind of sound. And she's like, oh, it fits perfectly at yeah, yeah, yeah. the end of this record. What a great way to close. And then, yeah, so you're in and out of A Wizard of True Star in under an hour. The so, second half is 29, 25. Yeah, but it seemed like a lot to process. I have a couple closing thoughts here. All um, right. My first is that I am going to bust that Utopia album out. Oh, okay. With this as the context, mm-hmm. I guess. See if you can get through that. Maybe. I feel like this album is Todd Rundgren saying, follow me. And we're like, where? And he's like, I don't know. But take this. But take this. <laughs> and it'll take you there. We already talked about this. It took me three tries to really warm my heart to it. And my final thought here is it's just so crazy. It just might work. I think that's a perfect way to end. Yeah. I love that thought. Yeah. Paul, thank you for indulging me on this journey of through. wizardry. And thank you all. <laughs> For listening, please send us an email and please be sure to check us out on social media. Thank you all for listening. Good night. Not not good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Do you have an opinion about the album we discussed today? Contact us at at now hear this podcast on Instagram, at now hear this pod on Twitter, facebook.com slash now hear this podcast. Or email us at nowhearthisofficial at gmail.com. See you next time.
Excuse me, some of us like Bananarama.